Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Martin and Milena. I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. I hope that someday, they mentioned I've done this three times. I've, this is my third virtual time. I hope that someday I will actually get to do this in person. Uh, but anyway, thank you all for watching. Um, so I guess I should say that this is very much a work in progress. I uh, um, had been, uh, um, it's very much a work in progress. I uh, got a, a grant, uh, some money and some uh, release time from my school, uh, which is a private engineering college um, to do some, uh, a three-year grant to do projects involving combining technical education uh, with art. So uh, one of the things that I did was to buy a computer controlled loom and uh, just this past weekend, uh, last Saturday, uh, I did the first workshop for students using this uh, computer controlled loom. And so mostly what I'm gonna do is tell you about the loom and tell you how the workshop went. And uh, um, cool. unfortunately, um, there's not going to be, there's only going to be a little bit of fractals at the end, but I'm happy to take questions about my plans for future fractals. So, um, I want to say a little bit about weaving. So weaving is making cloth in a particular way by interlacing threads, um, uh, two sets of threads usually. And uh, weavers uh, tend to talk about the warp threads. Can everybody see my cursor? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, weavers talk about the warp threads, uh, which go vertically or along the dimension of the loom. I'll show you a loom in a bit. Um, and weft threads, which go back and forth tying the warp threads together. And there are various ways in which can, various patterns in which one can do this. And I'll also talk about that a little bit later. Um, but uh, like I said, I wanna start with the sort of mechanism of how a loom works. Um, the very basic idea is you have these warp threads going this way and somehow some of the warp threads are selected to be lifted away from the other warp threads. Uh, that forms an opening known as a shed. Um, and then you use something to pass the weft threads back and forth through the shed. So you pass it through the shed and then you change the shed, meaning some of the threads that were up go down and some of the threads that were down go up. And then you pass it back the other way and then you repeat. Um, so the, the changing of the shed, uh, the difference between which threads are up and which threads are down, um, interlocks the threads together so that you actually get cloth and it just doesn't all fall apart. Uh, please feel free uh, to, to stop for questions. I can see the audience, so raise your hand if you want me to, to stop and explain something, something better as we go along. I'm fine with that. Um, so uh, there are, uh, as I said, various different ways in which you can control um, which threads are lifted up and which are not. Um, I'm going to be focusing on uh, shaft looms and in particular multi-shaft looms. So each of these frames is often known as a shaft here. And picking up one of the shafts um, picks up these heddles, uh, which maybe you can see have holes in them, and the warp threads go through the heddles. So when you, when you select one of these shafts to pick up, um, that picks up a set of the threads uh, in the warp. And that controls the, what the th cloth looks like, what the pattern on the cloth is going to be. Um, so uh, this particular loom uses levers, uh, which would be connected to cords, which aren't shown here, which pick up the, the shafts. Uh, ah, here you can see the cords. So the levers pick up the cords, and that picks up the different shafts. Again, there are different ways to do that. And that's going to become um, somewhat important. Uh, so originally, the, the very first uh, looms, weavers just used their fingers and just you know, literally picked up some of the threads and passed the weft under them. Um, so this is a, um, a contemporary picture from Wikipedia, but uh, uh, this is a, an extremely old style of loom, um, several thousands of years old for this style of loom. Uh, the, the traces of these looms have been found. Um, so uh, later looms uh, added levers uh, on top, like I mentioned, or for larger looms, you might have foot pedals. So uh, the one on the right, I don't actually know the date of this loom, 
uh, but it looks like it's got just two pedals controlling two shafts um, and a fairly simple mechanism for gathering up the cloth as you make it. Uh, the one on the left here, um, I'm not entirely sure the artist understood uh, how the loom worked because I can't quite <laughs> figure out how the pedals are supposed to be connected to the shafts, but there appear to be at least six uh, pedals and six shafts drawn, but um, not entirely sure how, how that was supposed to work. Um, you can also see in this uh, uh, the beater, um, which is used to just push all the warp threads together um, so that uh, it's nice and tidy. That's not going to be a big uh, uh, point of this talk, but just in case you were wondering what that thing was. And you can, I think, see it uh, in front of the shafts here, too. Um, still later, uh, in, to be exact, in 1804, although there were uh, the last hundred years before that, there were developments leading up to this, uh, the Jacquard loom was developed. And um, technical people often know about this because um, it's the first machine that was widely used with punch cards. So um, there was a mechanism where each hole in the punch card uh, corresponded to whether uh, one of these threads, so this is not a shaft loom, each of these threads was actually controlled individually by one of these holes. So as you can see, there are very many holes in the, in the cards, um, and these cards are very large. They're not like the punch cards that uh, um, were used in IBM uh, computers. They are um, several, several feet across and, and several inches high. Um, and so you could get very intricate patterns and pictures and so on um, by punching them into these cards. So um, another uh, uh, view, this is a, um, a more modern one, which works the same way, um, being used in India. And you can maybe see the mechanism um, which reads the holes by, by uh, usually there are some spring controlled levers. And if there's a hole, the lever can pop into the hole and that triggers something. Um, again, um, IBM punch cards, especially uh, in the 70s when they were, uh, you know, reached their culmination before being obsolete, were read optically. Um, these looms obviously didn't read that in 1804. Um, and uh, just some more examples that maybe show you the different possible mechanisms that you can use. Some of these were motorized, some of them were just operated by hand. All right. uh, but what I'm going to be talking about is a Dobby loom. And a Dobby loom is sort of a compromise between the Jacquard loom and the treadle loom. In fact, the one on the right here is a refitted treadle loom. So you can see that there's a bunch of skinny um, foot pedals and two wider ones. Uh, the skinny ones are for the original mechanism that you push on a pedal and it just manually raises one or more shafts. Um, but if you push on one of the wider pedals, um, it uh, um, advances this chain. And these chains, um, I don't know if you can see, but these are bars which have pegs screwed into them, um, which is sort of the inverse of a punch card instead of uh, um, something snapping through the hole in order to, to uh, trigger the thread. Um, in this case, the uh, lever on the, uh, sorry, the peg on the bar pushes against um, a lever to, to uh, trigger the thread. And I'll say more about how that's triggered. Uh, these were developed around 1843. Here's a picture of one from 1892, which looks really virtually the same as this one from 1987, almost exactly 100 years later. Um, nowadays, these are produced for hobbyists. These would not be, uh, this, this uh, method would not be used for production. Uh, the Jacquard method is still used for production. Um, and as you saw in some countries, even the punch card version. Um, although in this country, Jacquard looms would, uh, or yeah, in the United States, I should say, uh, and in Germany too, I believe, uh, Jacquard looms are mostly computerized. And I'll talk a little more, bit more about that too. Um, I've just gone through a lot of things really quickly. Are there any questions about that? Looks good. Okay. So 
1843, uh, the Jacquard Lum, and maybe since this was about the time that uh, Charles Babbage was working, I'll just quickly mention that right around uh, uh, that time in the mid 1800s, Charles Babbage had the idea of using these same sorts of punch card and uh, um, Dobby mechanisms to control something um, which could uh, operate on data instead of operating on threads. Um, and that was the idea of uh, Babbage's analytical engine. So, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Oops, wrong way. So inevitably Dobby looms were hooked up to computers. Um, Jacquard looms, as I said, um, Dobby looms are not really used for uh, production weaving, for industrial weaving anymore. Um, uh, Jacquard looms are, so those were hooked up to computers first, but Dobby looms were eventually, um, I believe in the 80s first, um, hooked up to computers. Um, and so we have a computer controlling which shafts are going to be lifted. So this is the 32 shaft loom, which is a, um, something that would be extremely unwieldy to control with foot pedals. Um, this is controlled by a computer. Uh, oh, I should mention that the uh, mechanical Dobby on the other page was an eight shaft. Um, so this is, this is pushing the, the Dobby loom pretty hard um, and uh, can get um, quite intricate patterns, although not um, quite the, uh, the picture quality that you can get on a Jacquard loom. Um, where each thread is individually controlled. And this is a standard laptop, uh, just a Lenovo, uh, fairly inexpensive Lenovo controlling that. So how does it control it? Um, so this is the standard uh, form of expressing a weaving pattern. If you buy a weaving magazine, you might see a pattern like this. Um, these over here um, control uh, which shafts are being lifted. Um, along the top uh, is a matrix. These are basically matrices. This is a matrix that controls which shafts are being lifted. And I mean that in the mathematical sense. This is uh, uh, with ones and zeros. The black and white are representations of ones and zeros, if you, you can think of it that way. This is a matrix that controls um, which uh, threads are connected to which shaft. So the shafts are um, numbered one through 32 horizontally here and one through 32 vertically there. And then this is the combination, which it actually turns out, fun fact, is literally the multiplication of the two um, matrices. And that is the final picture that you'll get. Uh, the computer software keeps track of which row is being woven. Uh, from the computer's point of view, the weaving cycle starts actually when you take the foot off the treadle. So there is one, uh, just one pedal on this uh, uh, loom. Um, that activates a set of solenoids. So this is the Dobby box. That's the input from the computer going into it. And you can see one, two, three, four, five levers. Uh, no, that's, yeah, five levers are being pressed by five activated solenoids, which I'm not entirely sure you can see, but these uh, round things there are the solenoids and the, some of them are being pushed out, which activates them. The other way around activates them, they're pushed out, wrong way again. Solenoids push some screws on these um, bars into the path of this thing, which is called the Dobby knife. Then when you push down on the, sorry, the typo there, foot treadle, you push down on the foot treadle, the Dobby knife pulls down on those screws. That pulls up, uh, well, that pulls down on some cords over here, which are tied over here to the shafts, which are then pulled up. So the computer, all the computer does is decide which of these screws are gonna be pushed out. Everything else the weaver has to be, has to do. But the fact that the computer makes all the decisions on you know, two to the 32 different choices of which um, shafts are gonna be lifted uh, makes a, an enormous difference in the weaving process. Um, but and then that creates the question. Yeah, one quick question. Can you give us an idea as to this still, despite the usage of the computer, 
there still seems to be quite a mechanical process, right? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. can you give us an idea how many of these uh, operations I want to call it uh, does that make? Is it like one uh, a second, one a minute? Uh, uh, it can go very fast, more than one a second. I'll show you a video in a moment. Okay, cool. Yeah, but it can go quite fast because you don't have to think about it. Also, okay. with with practice. Um, you can you all you, you push the lever, uh, the foot lever. You push the foot lever. You put this shuttle containing the warp threads. Oops, tried to point with my finger. Put this shuttle through the shed. Um, pull the beater bar back to to push everything into place, um, and then repeat. And you can do that very fast with just a little bit of practice. Oh, wow. So um, I had about a dozen students trying out the loom. Um, they seemed to have a really good time. Um, learned a couple of lessons. Uh, one is that I should use a less fragile thread or <laughs> loosen up the tension. Um, thread started breaking at the edges. Um, you can see we lost about half the threads over the course of a three hour workshop. <laughs> um, but I didn't worry about it because um, my goal was to give the students a chance to get hands on with, uh, with uh, not too much of a learning curve. So I just, as long as you know it was still functional, and you can see they were still you know weaving a pattern even with uh, half the threads missing. So uh, I just let it go. So the thing done well was I separated the product from the process there. Um, so the pro they learned the process. Um, we didn't get a good product really, but they learned the process and they had a good time. And so here's a video. Can you see that? It's not yeah. moving right now, but okay. So this is this is one student finishing up. I don't know if you can hear the video. In fact, it's probably better if you can't. Yeah. Uh, they're not saying anything very interesting. Yeah, we can't hear the sound anyway. Good. All right. <laughs> Nothing very interesting was going on. Um, here's a new student. Um, as far as I know, um, until today, until this day, this was, I think, not the first, not his first try at the loom, although I might be wrong. Um, but this this day was definitely his first day on the loom. And, you know, so after no more than a, a, a I didn't, no more than a few minutes really of practice, this is as fast as he was going. This is real time. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, like I said, um, this was not high quality cloth that was being made. Um, an experienced weaver would be paying much more attention to uh, um, keeping the, the fabric even as they went, um, but, uh, and, and not getting things, uh, you know, running into tangles like you just did. Um, <laughs> but really, yeah, an experienced weaver could go at least that fast um, easily, could easily go at least that fast. So, all right. Um, so I was really just using the pattern that uh, uh, I bought the loom secondhand. Somebody had already set up the pattern, um, so I decided to just go with it in the interest of, you know, getting students onto the loom as fast as possible. So it wasn't a very mathematical pattern. Um, what I would like to do is develop some fractal patterns. So this is, this is the first one that I'd like to get set up on the loom myself. Uh, the catch here is that you can't have um, long uh, stretches of the same color going acrosswise because that means that there are what are called floats, which is so every stretch of the same color going across, if you're not careful, um, that's a, a, a thread that doesn't, that's not tied down by anything. So um, if I can maybe make it back quickly, oh, I don't know why I have it in this mode. Um, if I can go back to the pattern I was using, you can see these speckles, which are basically just there to avoid those long um, non tied down threads. So most fractal patterns have some long tied non tied down threads, even this one has um, uh, has some, and uh, 
Um, basically, you have to devote a couple of shafts to putting in speckles. Um, oh, and here, right? So there are some speckles that you probably can't really see. Maybe I can zoom in. Yeah, the resolution isn't good enough anyway. Um, but there are some speckles that you, you have to devote the uh, uh, two shafts at least to do that. And when you have two shafts out of 32, um, that's an awkward number left to form the pattern. <laughs> 32 would be lovely if I could use them all for a fractal pattern, but I can't. Um, this one uses 27, which seems like a nice number. Um, every different vertical column needs a different shaft. So basically there are three to the three different vertical columns. You might imagine how that works, or I can try to explain it in detail if people are interested. Um, so that uses 29 out of the 32, which is as close as I've managed to be able to get. Um, a, lot of, a lot of patterns use a power of two for the number of shafts, and then I can only use 16 plus two, which, you know, I got 32 shafts. I'd like to use as many of them as possible. So working on more patterns that do that and actually weaving them is the future, the next step in this project. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions.